We're here again in the Integrated Rangeland Management class here at the University of Idaho. I'm Karen Launchbaugh, and we're moving into a section of the class where we're going to start making decisions. The first important decision to make is how many animals to put on the range or the stocking rate. In order to get there, you've got to know how much animals eat. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Most of this discussion is going to center around an article that was written by Robert Lyons and his colleagues at Texas A&M, where they really laid out what you need to know to understand forage intake. So go ahead and take a look at this paper, which is posted on the class web page, or go ahead and Google it and download it. It, it gives the details of what we're going to talk about. Okay, there's three kinds of factors that affect herbivore intake. Some of them are related to the herbivore, some are related to forage, and some are related to the environment. The size and species of the herbivore makes a difference. The physiological state, whether the animal's uh, dry or pregnant or, um, or, or lactating. There's also several forage characteristics we're going to talk about, including quality, water quantity, and then we will talk about uh, supplements, supplemental feeding and environmental characteristics. Start thinking about herbivore species. We've talked about this before, but one of the really important uh, distinctions when you start thinking about setting stocking rates or managing animals on rangeland is whether the animal is a hindgut fermenter or a ruminant. Uh, there's a pretty good summary of this in an, uh, the range management textbook called Principles and Practices. And uh, here's kind of an overview. When you're in a situation on the top two animals where you've got you're short of, of forage, but it's fairly good quality, then an animal such as ruminant would do a better, would be better because they can take what forage there is available and they, they ruminate for a long time, about 80 hours for rate of passage. So they really completely digest what's out there. Horses or uh, rabbits, hindgut fermenters, on the other hand, their strategy is to just take what's there and pass it through very quickly. So they have higher intake, higher rate of passage and they just sort of take the best and, and get rid of the rest. So in a low forage situation with fairly high quality or moderate quality, ruminants do better. On the bottom uh, set of uh, graphs where you've got really old, dense forage, then hindgut fermenters uh, are more likely to survive because they have higher intake. There's plenty of forage available. It's a very low quality. So they just uh, take the, you know, again, take the forage, digest the best of it and just get the rest of it out. Ruminants have that omasal orifice you might remember from earlier discussions where once they eat something they have to really completely digest it and ruminate it before they can pass it through. So they're stuck with uh, spending their time just ruminating low quality forage and, and they can't get enough quality and quantity to, to survive. This might explain why we have um, feral horses that they're able to um, survive on rangelands on very low quality forage. Okay, so uh, first uh, um, distinction between ruminants and hindgut fermenters, that's the first distinction you need to make. Horses have a much higher rate of passage. They eat more. Uh, horses actually eat about 70% more than a ruminant. So if you had a 1,000 pound cow, it would eat 25 pounds a day, about on a dry matter basis. A similar sized horse would eat 42 pounds a day. So it's, it's actually not a small amount, it's quite different. Remember also that cattle or ruminants have the advantage of digesting the rumen microbes because the rumen is before the true stomach. They get extra protein and vitamin B from those microbes. Herbivore size is also important. Herbivores, uh, ruminants especially, can range in intake from 2% of their body weight a day to 4% depending on their size and the type of animal. That 2 to 4% is called an intake factor. It um, suggests or predicts the amount of dry matter an animal will eat as a percentage of their body weight. Smaller animals, remember, also have higher energy demands per unit of body weight than larger animals. So therefore, smaller animals will tend to eat um, higher quality forage and more of it as a percent of body weight. Here's a few numbers to go behind that concept. Um, that smaller animals eat more as a percentage of their body weight. Let's start at the top of the graph. If you have a, a cow or a bull that weighs 1,000 to 1,500 pounds, they'll eat about 2.5% of their body weight. So that would be 25 to pounds to 37 or 38 pounds. If you have a little smaller animal, maybe a, a younger a steer heifer or an elk that might weigh 500 to 1,000 pounds, they would eat 3% of their body weight. A smaller animal, uh, say a deer or a pronghorn that weighs 100 pounds, um, 
to 500 pounds, three and a half percent of their body weight, and an animal much smaller that's less than 100 pounds uh, would eat uh, four percent of their body weight. So it really, it really makes quite a difference. Smaller animals eating a higher percentage of their body weight. Uh, these are some uh, figures right out of that paper by Lyons, and you can see what that intake factor is. Again, for mule deer, you might just put in your head that they eat about 3.5% of their body weight. Small animals like goats, uh, angora goats or, or small Spanish goats, might eat up to 4% of their body weight. Physiological state is also important. Remember, the greatest demand during a an, an uh, female's uh, life cycle in a year is when they're lactating. So they can eat 35 to 50 percent more forage when they're lactating when they're not than when they're dry or or when they're not lactating. That's called dry. Intake generally declines as in late gestation. So as you get um, to that uh, last third of trimester, they have fairly high demand, but the fetus starts to take up quite a bit of space. And so that reduces space in the rumen. And then another thing that happens in late gestation is um, estrogen levels go up and that can reduce appetite. So it's an interesting thing, even at the end, as the, you get to the end of uh, room, that very last part of gestation when the fetus is very large, it's sometimes hard for animals to meet their intake demand. Here's what that looks like in a, in a graph, again, out of this paper by Lyons in that uh, F3, which is the first third of partrition or the first trimester of uh, pregnancy intake is at some level that stays about the same to the middle of partrition when you get that late or third trimester of pregnancy you might see a decrease in intake and then as soon as the calf or lamb or uh, feet, uh, the uh, foal is born you will see an increase in intake because then you go into that early lactation at, at a low level and then ml is moderate lactation and high lactation where you'll start to see a much higher increase maybe what's important to look at is if an animal is eating uh, two percent of their body weight in late patrician then that could go up to three percent of their body weight when they're lactating another a set of factors that affect intake is the season or the forage quality so take a look at this graph think in your mind when would animals eat the most when would they be able to have the highest intake in the winter spring summer or fall okay we know they're going to eat the most during lactation but the forage quality is going to influence their ability to eat food also and i'm, I'm going to explain what what i used to think would happen is that animals might eat less in the spring because the forage is quality is very high so they don't need to eat as much and then they would eat more in the fall because forage quality is low but that's actually not what happens during the winter, the forage quality is low and animals, especially ruminants, can't process that much food. So their intake is, that's when it's at the lowest. As the forage starts to grow quickly and become very digestible and very nutri nutrient rich, they, they increase their intake. So intake is highest in spring and then it decreases throughout the season, throughout the summer until you get to the point where it's fairly low in the fall. So this graph here looks very much like the forage quality graph that we had in a previous section of the class. So um, intake increases when animals can eat a lot, when the food is very digestible and they are able to eat a lot. So yes, high nutrient value and digestibility means animals need to eat less but to meet their demand. But at that same point, and, uh, the food is highly digestible and animals do eat more. Therefore, increase, uh, intake increases as forage quality increases. Here's a graph that just identifies that or just kind of clarifies that again in this paper by Lyons the potential increase is forage demand um, is forage digestible increases the ability the potential increase intake increases even though the required intake decreases water content can also affect intake but it's largely because it's related to digestibility we used to think that water content could be so high in forage that it would make it so animals couldn't eat a much eat uh, the forage that they they just couldn't process the water in it but that's really not true water is generally easily absorbed out of forage there might be sometimes really early in the spring when forage is very high in water and that there might be a limit in intake at that time but it's probably not because of the high moisture it's probably just because of limited forage availability in the spring other foraging characteristics a uh, forage characteristics that can affect intake uh, moist leafy material is palatable and easily eaten uh, more so than the, the dry stemmy material 
forages that provide large bite size or greater bite rates are easier for animals to eat and they have therefore greater intake. And then don't forget that the compounds in, in plants, especially anti-quality compounds, and especially those that cause nausea can increase, I'm sorry, can suppress intake and halt foraging. Now, turning into those management or environment factors, we've talked a bit about how supplementation can influence intake in the past. If you're in a low protein setting, in other words, you're in the fall or winter where there's not enough protein, supplementing protein can actually benefit the rumen microbes and increase intake on the range. If you're in a situation where there's plenty of protein in the environment and then you supplement protein or nitrogen, you'll generally depress intake because animals will just focus on the supplement and not on the forages. And also if you, if you supplement protein very high, you might even have some nitrate um, toxicity in, when animals try to eat those forages. Energy supplementation has similar settings when you're in low energy uh, settings, animals and you supplement animals with energy, that will help them meet their demand, but they'll probably continue to foraging, they'll continue to forage and there'll be no effect on intake. If you've got plenty of energy in the environment and you start supplementing energy, such as corn or other energy supplement, then that will have a substitution effect. And then the forage will actually, the animals will actually re to de decrease their uh, foraging activity. Here's what that looks like in a graph. Again, if you're in a low, a low protein setting, you, you uh, supplement protein, especially if you're in a situation that's less than 6% protein in the forage, that'll benefit the microbes. They'll eat more in the environment until you get to some level where uh, the, there's so much protein in the environment that you're having uh, some issues with too much protein. Energy, on the other hand, uh, you can easily get to a situation where if you supplement, anim uh, if you supplement energy, uh, corn or other energy supplements, you'll start to depress intake because you'll have that substitution effect. Foraging standing crop is also uh, also affects intake. Um, here we have two pictures to the right. One is a beautiful picture of the Kansas rangelands where there's plenty of forage. And when you get to a set, setting like that where you have more than 2,500 pounds of forage, then the amount of forage does not affect intake. Animals eat as much as they want. If you get to a setting where you're 2,500 to about 1,000 pounds, then you might get to such a situation where as um, the forage supply decreases, the amount of standing forage crop, intake might, might also decline. And then on the bottom chart over there on the right, when you get to less than 1,000 pounds of forage, you can rapidly affect intake. So there is a situation where you don't have enough forage out on the ground and it's very hard for animals to meet their energy and nutrient demand, so that does affect their intake. Uh, there's also another way to think about this is what we call a forage allowance, and that's the amount of pounds that you need per thousand pounds of animal weight. We'll talk about that in a graph here. So here's a graph that gives that idea about a forage allowance. Now this isn't very useful unless you have a good measure of how much forage you have, and if you do, then you could say that your forage allowance should be something between two to five pounds per. 1,000 pounds of animal. So if you get less than about two and a half, you can see that intake um, it just it, is down precipitously. If you get above five, then you see that animals can approach their maximum intake. So just when you know how much forage you have and you want to see if you've got enough for your animals, you can use this, a forage allowance factor. Also remember that environmental factors can affect intake. We've talked about this when we talked about demand. If in cold temperatures that can increase intake demand, the animals need more nutrients to stay warm. But that can be difficult to forage out on the range because of snow, ice, storms, etc. So uh, it can be a be uh, increase intake or decrease. Hot temperatures also you have de decreased intake just because of decreased appetite. You might also see a change in behavior where you see more animals feeding more at night because of the night cooling effect. Uh, again, a graph from that paper by Lyons shows um, those two effects that that TNZ in the middle is that shaded area is the thermal neutral zone. So that's the area where animals are not too hot, not too cold. If you get below that thermal neutral zone and you get in rain and snow and ice, you can really have precipitous loss in intake, decrease in intake, uh, just because of in, the animals can't get out to the to forage. If you get mild conditions or maybe some muddy conditions, you can have increased intake as temperatures get colder. And that's just because they're still able to access the forage, um, but their demand is higher. 
So again, intake when it's cold can go up or down depending on access to forage. On the right-hand side of the thermal neutral zone where it gets hotter, usually we have a decrease in intake. And if you have night cooling, you can still the animals can still maintain relatively high intake. If there's no night cooling because there's very high humidity or um, it's, it's just in a situation where the nights are not cooling down much, then intake can go down quite significantly. So when it's really hot, even though animals might have energy demand, um, they have decreased intake. So in conclusion, there's a lot of factors that affect intake. Some are related to the animal, some are related to the forage supply, and some are related to the environment. Understanding forage intake and your ability to meet animal demands really depends on the animal's nutrient status. And then just remember in your back pocket, we're talking about two and a half to 4% of body weight per year. And those are just gross averages. And we always kind of talk in averages when we're setting stocking rates, which we'll do later. Um, that just really glosses over the true variation that the changes in environment or animal might have. So the real art of range science is, is being able to mix and multitask and understand those variation in animal and environment. That's all we have on trying to understand uh, herbivore intake and we'll bring that into setting stocking rates in a future lecture.